Welcome to Stuff You Should Know, a production of iHeartRadio. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh Clark, and there's Charles W. Chuck Bryan over there, and Jerry's hanging around somewhere lurking with an unclean spirit in a haunted hotel. And this is Stuff You Should Know. Uh, yeah. Can, can we do a couple of quick announcements? Uh, yeah, sure. Without singing that announcement song? Did we have an announcement song ever? Well, not us, but it like summer camp. Okay. You never did that? No. Yeah, well, I'm not going to sing it now then. I kind of want to hear it now. No, 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 no. Was it like uh, announcements, announcements, it's announcements time? It Sort of, almost. Yeah, that, that's close <laughs> enough. <laughs> Uh, trigger warning for this one. First announcement, because mm-hmm. there's some grisly stuff in here. Uh, I guess that's all we need to say. Okay. And then also, we've been remiss in that we haven't mentioned the fact that there's a stuff you should know board game out. Yeah, it's it's not grisly at all. No, it's it's very <laughs> family friendly. In fact, it's one of the highest honors that's ever been bestowed upon us and stuff you should know, Chuck. Because out of the blue, out of nowhere. About a year and a half ago, maybe? Yeah. Trivial Pursuit. The makers of Trivial Pursuit got in touch with us and said, we want to do a Stuff You Should Know Trivial Pursuit game. And they That's did. Right. It wasn't a <laughs> practical joke. <laughs> the fine people at Hasbro, who I got to say, I mean, we've worked with a lot of outside companies for various projects. Mm-hmm. And boy, Hasbro is about as tight and buttoned up and awesome as any company we've ever worked with. Right, but also like super friendly, super fun, super nice. They're amazing. And not in like that creepy, everybody's trying to be nice way. Like they're all just like a genuinely yeah. pleasant group to work with. But yes, they are super buttoned up as well. Very they rare make games. Animal. Yeah, so they make like, games. They all seem like they make games for a living, which would mean you know, that you have a pretty cool job. And developing the game with them was fun. And the questions are based on real stuff you should know episodes. Mm-hmm. And it is not just Trivial Pursuit. It is uh, co-branded. So it is not, do not expect to get the Trivial Pursuit game with the little pieces of pie. No, no. Just want to be clear. They said, we want to make up a brand new game for brand this. Brand new game. And they did. They, they made up a game. And this is the Stuff You Should Know Trivial Pursuit game. That's right. And you can get it wherever you get games. Uh, I recommend your local uh, little indie toy gaming store if they have it. And, yeah. But otherwise, we would love the support. You got a weirdo in your town who dresses up in wizard clothes and goes to work? Go buy your game there. <laughs> yeah, great Christmas gift, by the way. Yeah, for sure. Also, uh, why why just stop there? It's great for dads, grads, moms, proms, <laughs> everything. <laughs> I think it's like 20 bucks, right? Yeah, it's like really, it? really um, reasonably priced, if you ask me. $20. 20 bucks. Right. You got two 20s in your wallet. You could buy our book and the game at the so same we time. So did, uh, <laughs> we did the TV show. We did uh, a book. Mm-hmm. We do a podcast. Don't forget our YouTube series. Oh, sure. Who can? <laughs> and, and now, then... <laughs> now, Chuck. And now the game. It's amazing. And now the Hotel Cecil. Yes, on to the show. Um, So I'm glad you did that little trigger warning because uh, there is some grisly stuff in here. But there's also, I think, some like fact settings, some fact straightening that, um, you know, we should do from the outset. Because uh, one of the things that um, people who get into the Elisa Lamb story, which we'll talk about in a little bit, um, quickly find that there are all manner of internet urban legends and myths and conspiracy theories surrounding it. And none of those seem to be true. Um, and we It's should, pretty annoying, actually. Yeah, it is very annoying. It's just so internet-y, too. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, this, uh, this goes on a lot these days, but it seems like this one may be more so than even others. Mm-hmm. Because the bizarre nature of one part of this story and... Uh, I don't know. I, I found myself slightly annoyed. I, I am too. In the exact same way that I'm annoyed by people who believe that the couple from The Conjuring were like, you know, legit in real life. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Sure. But at the same time, it goes even further than that. I think I ran across a couple of articles that I really think struck home 
what's genuinely annoying and even disrespectful about that is that like Elisa Lamb died because she had serious uh, mental illness. Yeah. That had been diagnosed and she wasn't managing properly with the medications that she was on. And that happens a lot. And she died because of it. And so to say that she was, in, you know, possessed by evil spirits um, or that there were, you know, ghosts at the Cecil or even that she was murdered by an unknown suspect, it's really, it really, um, well, it really disrespects the reality of the situation, which is, you know, sad enough as it is. But at the same time, Chuck, there's one more thing I have to caveat all this with. It's understandable the impulse to to bring in, you know, restless spirits and you know, you know the just conspiracy theories. It, it's understandable in this particular situation because of the setting. Yeah, uh, and I guess you know the the first part of this show will be about the setting, which is the Hotel Cecil in downtown Los Angeles, which is. Not open right now. Um, it may be open in the future. Mm-hmm. I think they were doing a uh, – this thing was open in the 1920s during the height of the Depression. And it's a very large hotel, 19 floors, 700 rooms. Mm-hmm. And in the 1920s, it was sort of like a um, a big deal for downtown Los Angeles. It was near a major rail station, and it was kind of just what L.A. needed. And it was kind of fancy schmancy for the time. Um, and over the years, you know, we'll talk a little bit about the downfall. But uh, at the time of Elisa Lamb's stay, they had carved out three floors and built a separate lobby entrance to try and uh, in an effort to rebrand this hotel as something called Stay on Main. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that they had three kind of floors that were a little bit redone cosmetically, uh, a little bit of a nicer lobby that was, you know, sort of away from... Um, you know, some of the situations that we're going to detail here in a second. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they did all share a common elevator. And um, Elisa Lamb was staying in the state on main, uh, stay on main section. <laughs> state on main. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, but that's just to point out the fact that the hotel was going to eventually supposedly undergo a massive renovation and that it was all sort of put on hold because of COVID. And I think now it's just being sat on with some of the, uh, long-term tenants that are protected uh, to stay there. Yeah, I think there's like 30, but there's, yeah. like you said, 700 rooms. Sure. But you said it, um, that the the Cecil Hotel, um, which is very much down at the heels now, um, so did life in a much different way, where it was meant to be like a, a pretty nice hotel designed for middle-class travelers to L.A. And that situation next to the rail station was a big draw for it. It was a, it was a, definitely a feather in its cap. Um, and I saw it's in the Beaux-Arts style. Um, it's not incredibly pretty from the outside, but the inside lobby is still pretty neat looking. Sure. Lots of terrazzo tile and uh, columns, and there's fake um, Roman statuary and a big clock and like the, at the, over the check-in desk. It's really pretty and a really like, you know, 1920s original um, original style still, although it's just kind of got this drab air that's kind of fallen over it over the years. Yeah, and that is in large part because, um, like you said, there are a lot of unhoned people there today, a lot back then. Uh, the area called Skid Row of downtown Los Angeles is kind of right there. Uh, I used to drive through that area sometimes mm-hmm. when I lived in L.A. Mm-hmm. when uh, we would go downtown to eat sushi or if we, you know, back then when I lived there downtown was not as much of a destination unless you were going to Staples Center or something, but it's made a real resurgence since I've left and kind of trying to build downtown back up. Um, but Skid Row is still uh, an issue. And they're, you know, like you said, the, the, there are people there that work with unhomed folks that are really trying their best to take care of them. And the fact that that hotel is right there, just sort of looming large is a bit of a thumb in the eye. Yeah. And I get the impression that Skid, the area that's now Skid Row in Los Angeles had had, at least since the 1880s, kind of had a an unusual reputation. It wasn't always, you know, for people down on their luck or anything like that. But, um, you know, it was a little more low rent, 
than other parts of Los Angeles. Like there were, there was just a, a mishmash of all sorts of different people. It seemed like really alive. Um, and the CISO was kind of built at the outskirts of that between what would become Skid Row and then one of the nicest parts of L.A. at the time, Bunker Hill. Um, and everything was hunky-dory for the Cecil when it first opened in either 1924 or 1927, depending on who you ask. I could not confirm one way or the other yeah. because both dates have kind of taken off so much. Um, but when the stock market crashed, that area that was just kind of colorful and a little bit low rent, that it quickly became uh, skid row as we understand it, uh, beginning around the Great Depression. Uh, and not only... Um, did the the proximity to Skid Row kind of like lower the um, Cecil Star rating? Um, when the the tenants started, the the hotel guests started to dry up. They had to lower their rates and start catering to um, mm-hmm. people who people of less means. And so the hotel just kind of stopped taking care of itself little by little, starting around the Great Depression and continuing on through World War Two. Yeah, and you know it kind of became a. a last resort kind of destination for people with addiction problems, um, people in the, in the sex working industry. And, you know, it got that reputation and pretty soon got a reputation for all kinds of bad things happening there. Um, there have been no less than 15 or 16, um, what's classified, I guess, as an unnatural death mm-hmm. at the Cecil. Uh, many people take, uh, took their own lives there. Um, Quite a few. I mean, if you read down the laundry list, it's like quite a few people in, ingested poison. Quite a few people jumped or maybe were pushed out windows. Uh, there have been some murders by gun. There have been murders by strangulation. There have been sexual assaults. Uh, this one sad case of a woman who gave birth to uh, a baby and was um, suffering from some sort of mental illness evidently thought her baby was uh, was born not alive and went to throw the baby out the window. And it turns out the baby was alive, then then died. Uh, she was found um, not guilty. I think temporary insanity mm-hmm. uh, was the plea there. And just weird, kind of tragic, awful things happening over the years, time and time again at the Hotel Cecil. Yeah, like uh, another... Um frequently referred to incident was where a woman named uh, Pauline Otten, um, she jumped from, I think, like the ninth or 10th floor to take her own life and um, landed on a, a guy who was a passerby who happened to just be walking unluckily beneath the Cecil at that moment on the sidewalk and was struck by uh, Pauline. Uh, and they were both killed. And... Um, like that that doesn't usually happen very often like that's a pretty remarkable thing and i know that that like the most i could find was i think 18 incidents but it yeah. seems like those are just ones that have been documented right. there seems to be quite a bit more um there was a a netflix um series i think a four part series on this recently and they interviewed um a woman who had spent 10 years managing the cecil mm-hmm. um and she said that uh, her name is Amy Price. She said that under her 10-year tenure, at least 80 people died that she knows of. And you can kind of imagine, like, like you know, you could find newspaper write-ups from, like, the 20s and 30s and 40s when somebody jumps out a window, and definitely when somebody jumps out a window and lands on a hapless pedestrian. Like, that's definitely going to be documented and make news. But if somebody on Skid Row overdoses and dies in this hotel— you know, is that going to be documented? So it's possible that there are a lot more people who have died at the Cecil um, under uh, from unnatural causes um, over the years than than just those seventeen or eighteen. Did you watch all of that documentary? No, I haven't seen it actually yet. Oh, okay. Have you seen the whole thing? What, yeah, uh, you know, I feel terrible because um, the director was is the great Joe Berlinger, who I actually had on Movie Crush. Hmm. Um, in, in a, one of my favorite episodes where we kind of just talked about documentary filmmaking, he's a legend. He did the Paradise Lost series. He did that documentary on Metallica when they're all in therapy. Oh, yeah? Uh, yeah, I mean, he's just he's just sort of the, a legend in the genre. I saw and he did the, uh, the Ted Bundy tapes recently. That's like his Yeah, he did that, and then he directed the movie version with, uh, what's his face? Ryan Zac Gosling. Efron. Yeah. <laughs> with who? I said Ryan Gosling. Oh, <laughs> 
close. <laughs> Another super handsome hunk. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that was a good movie, but this wasn't so great. I didn't love it. It felt kind of overlong and a little salacious and like. Yeah, that's the impression I had from reading about it. Yeah, so I was disappointed. But Joe is a great filmmaker and a good guy. So I, I feel kind of bad. I think it that's that. a fair caveat. A, good, yeah. a great filmmaker and a good guy can still make a hunk of poop. Yeah, <laughs> wasn't a hunk of poop. It was all right. Uh, okay. Uh, but maybe let's take a break and I'll. Uh, email Joe and tell him I'm sorry ahead of time. <laughs> All right. And we'll be right back. So, uh, okay. We're, we're, so we're, the Cecil Hotel starts to get a, a pretty, pretty, not a great reputation, even around town. I, I read an article on KCET.org, which I guess is a PBS station in SoCal. And they uh, said that local residents started to refer to the, um, the Cecil as the suicide. That was the name of the hotel for people around there. Um, and it just, it just kind of like, it just kept going. Like every time, you know, maybe a couple of years would pass without some high profile death in the hotel and then it would happen again. And and it would just reaffirm everybody's ideas that there was, that place just wasn't quite right. There was something wrong with it. Almost like it was a magnet for that kind of tragedy, you know? Yeah. I mean, I think most major cities have had at least one of these hotels Mm -hmm. that just sort of is inexpensive maybe in the wrong part of town and has a reputation sometimes for lurid activities and checking in and not checking out. Uh, and this was LA's and LA for sure had more than one. Sure. Um, it did not help their reputation in the 1980s uh, when Richard Ramirez, AKA the night stalker and one of the more sensational serial killers in American history, uh, he stayed there for a while and um, lived there and apparently brought body parts back to the Cecil Hotel. Mm-hmm. I said Cecil like I'm British. <laughs> uh, Cecil Hotel from some of his victims to ingest there. Uh, and that's certainly like super creepy. Wait, did you no say way around ingest? It. I hadn't come across that. Did he, he eat uh, that victim's eyeballs? I think so. Wow. We, man, and really other, jerk. he wasn't like... Uh, I don't think he was Dahmer level, but he was known to eat some body parts. He has a, there's a great documentary on his, his case too. It's yeah. It's super disturbing. Yeah. That's on Netflix as well. I think, um, yeah. if I'm not mistaken, but, um, one thing I hadn't realized before that I ran across when I was researching some of his stuff was how he was caught. It's just oh, dude, absolutely it's triumphant. <laughs> it, it was a, a mob of people yeah. in a neighborhood. In East LA. <laughs> He, yeah, he, it was great. he was spotted. He saw himself on the front page of the newspaper and just uh, instinctively started running, tried yeah. to carjack a woman, uh, hit her, uh, was seen hitting her. And, and an older man um, basically ran over and helped the helped the woman, pulled Richard Ramirez out of his car. And um, the woman whose car it was, husband, came over and started beating him. Uh, and he tried to get away and just a, an increasingly large mob chased him and would beat him and he'd get away some more and they'd chase him down and catch him again. And they finally pinned him down and waited for the cops to come. That's how it's he was the best. It's so yeah, great. And, uh, caveat that I'm not down with mob justice, but uh, a group case, of people finding a serial killer yeah. on the street and like subduing him. I'm way okay with that. No, I totally am. In this particular instance, like I'm all fine with that, that kind of justice for sure. Yeah. It was in a, bad, a badge of honor for uh, East LA. Cause the, the entire city of Los Angeles was, I mean, it was a scary situation there. Yeah. In the 80s. I can imagine that's yeah. where Cheech Marin was born. According to that one song of his. <laughs> that's right. Yep. So, uh, the Night Stalker, he was not the only serial killer that checked in there. He actually inspired, just a few years after he was convicted in, I think, 1989, uh, I think like in 92, maybe 93, there was another serial killer named Jack Unterweger, who uh, was Austrian, um, who had already been convicted, I think when he was like 19 or early 20s, of killing a woman by strangling her with her own bra. Yeah. Um, and went to prison. He was very, very smart, very charming. He used this to basically get 
early parole. He convinced the public that he was actually reformed and apparently was held up as like a great example of how, you know, the 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 prison system could rehabilitate someone. And it was right. just a complete false fabrication. He was basically posed as a true crime journalist, like he reinvented himself as that, went to LA and other parts. He went to Europe, traveled uh, through Europe a little bit too, but also ended up in LA um, to do research on his true crime novels. Went along on ride alongs with the LAPD um, and ended up using that to scout um, victims. He killed three sex workers, and the whole time he was staying at the Cecil Hotel, and they think probably as an homage to um, to Richard Ramirez, or at least a connection to him, you know? Yeah, so that, I mean, at this point, like, the reputation for the hotel, <laughs> it, it's not the kind of thing that uh, is going to appear online, you know, 15 years ago, mm-hmm. when young people like Elisa Lam are searching for an inexpensive place to stay. Mm-hmm. Uh, and sadly, that's exactly what happened was um, a Canadian traveler. Uh, she was 20, 21 years old, was on her way kind of up the West Coast, traveling by herself. Um, her parents were a little unnerved by her traveling by herself. So she was, you know, asked to check in every day, which she was doing. Uh, and at the time, it was, a, you know, they had kind of dorm style rooms, kind of youth hostel style rooms where yeah. you had bunk beds and a shared bathroom. And so you could stay there. It was a traveler's hotel. And if you, uh, you know, I hate to say it, but if you if you didn't know much about L.A., you may end up at the Hotel Cecil because you could stay there for like 75 bucks a night or something like that. Yeah, from what I could tell, Stay on Main did a really good job of making their, you know, using their website to their advantage and making it seem like this is a really hip happening spot. Mm-hmm. And I mean, they, in some ways, they were they were kind of like just a little ahead of their time because apparently that area around Skid Row in downtown LA is like the hippest spot to live in now again. Um, but at the time, it was still really, really um, Skid Rowy, basically. Yeah, um, and it could be it could be you know it could be dangerous. Yeah, and I think it still is, but I think it's just becoming more and more gentrified, and it's becoming, I guess, less dangerous in that sense. Um, but at the time when Elisa Lamb showed up in 2013, it was, you know, it was, it was a dangerous place to be, but, um, this particular spot was just full of, you know, especially European kids on basically budget holidays, uh, staying in LA, basically in hostels. And I know originally she was put into a room with a couple other girls that I think were traveling together, but she was traveling alone. So it was very hostile, um, and not hostile with an E. Right. Uh, well, yeah, there's an E, but <laughs> it's in a different place than you'd expect. Um, yes. Youth hostily. It was very youth hostily. Like she was put in a room with other people at first. Yeah. L.A. didn't have a lot of that. I remember there was a youth hostel in Venice that uh, for some reason I always wanted to stay there when I lived in L.A. I was like, I can go down and stay in that hostel one night because the, Pick the up beach was dudes. so f- – <laughs> the the beach was really far when you lived on the east side and you kind of never went over there much unless someone came to town and wanted to go to the beach. Oh, that makes sense. Sure. So, and you know, I was broke back then, so it, it could have been a, like a little staycation. Did you ever do it? Nah. No. Oh. Well, it's one of those things you think about late night and then you wake up the next day and you're like, nah. <laughs> <laughs> you blew all your money on Taco Bell instead. Oh man, I miss Taco Bell. Do you? I don't. Uh, I mean, I didn't need it that much, but like, I haven't had it in years. I, I've had too much, I think was my problem. Oh, uh, okay. Was that the deal? <laughs> By the way, side note, speaking of weird, uh, late night foods, mm-hmm. um, we had a guy on our front door camera the other day come in the middle of the night and leave a package. And we were like, what is this? We went out the next day and it was a bag full of crystals. Wow. And but I think it was creepy. A delivery. Like a DoorDash or something. Oh, crystals. I thought you meant like amethyst or No, no, no. I mean tiny square sliders. Yeah, he had the They're wrong like... address. <laughs> I think so. Either that or your daughter is, uh, has mastered the telephone by now. <laughs> it was really weird. And of course, the first thing I did was feel terrible that someone's uh, late night munchies didn't get satisfied. Did you eat them the next morning just as a Oh, homage? God, no. <laughs> no, no, no. No? no you don't like no, crystals? Sir. Or was it because it was sitting there overnight? Both. I never was into crystal for some reason. Man, I like crystals. 
I, it was the thing. I just was, I don't know why. I think I was just a Waffle House guy. Uh, I, I don't, uh, I'm fine with Waffle House too. The big sure. problem with crystals though, Chuck, I'll tell you, is their fries are probably the worst fries uh, of any <laughs> fast imagine. food location. They're <laughs> the most bland. Somehow, if you just bit into a raw potato, it would be less bland and tasteless <laughs> than if you ate a crystals fry. Yeah. Well, I they don't know how to do it. Blah. And if you're from the uh, other places in the country, you might uh, – White Castle is sort of an analog to Crystal. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, this is not an episode of the Doughboys. <laughs> this is stuff you should know. That's- and back to Elisa Lamb. Um, she was supposed to be there for about, I think, four days and check out on February 1st. Mm-hmm. And did not get in touch with her parents like she had been doing each day. Yeah. Um, she had been seen – shopping for books at a nearby bookstore and then bought some books. And this is one of the things in the documentary, like, you know, they didn't really have any footage of her with any other people inside the hotel before her disappearance. Well, she was also reported to be constantly by herself too, by people who saw her. Yeah. I mean, she was traveling alone. Mm-hmm. So that, that makes sense. Right. But um, she, she did get handed off. There were two gentlemen that handed off a kind of a largest, uh, largish box to her oh, yeah? on camera in front of the hotel. And of course the internet sleuths are like, who are these guys? What mm-hmm. was in the box? And apparently in the box were these books that she got because she had spoken with the book re- um, seller about like the size of them and boy, I don't even know if I can carry these mm. and I think had them delivered to the hotel or whatever. So kind of nothing to see here. And another example of how annoying this case can be with people online speculating like wrong stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Can be a little annoying for sure. But yes, yeah, so she was, she was alone traveling alone. I think she had started out in San Diego or at least her last stop had been San Diego. Her next stop was going to be Santa Cruz. Um, and yeah, her parents had been like, okay, you need to call us every single day. Um, and she had been pretty faithfully uh, until that February 1st came and went with no call. And I believe they pretty much immediately contacted the hotel and the LAPD and said, hey, you know, our daughter hasn't checked in. Can you see what's going on? I don't know if they did it on February 1st or not, but in pretty short order the LAPD determined that she she was just gone she wasn't she was nowhere to be found and that there was some suspiciousness going on for sure yeah i mean they did a thorough inspection they went to her room uh they had found that the hotel had gathered all her stuff and bagged it and was holding it in storage which was um regular protocol when someone um doesn't check out and just leave stuff mm-hmm. nothing shady going on there they Checked around the hotel uh, in the alleyways and sidewalks. They checked up on the roof. They didn't find anything. And uh, things got really strange. And I guess we should take another uh, ad break here. But things got really strange when the hotel sent them footage from inside the elevator of the Cecil Hotel. And we'll get to that right after this. All right, Chuck. So Elisa Lamb is now known to be missing. She left her stuff behind at the Cecil Hotel and she didn't check out. She didn't call her parents as she usually did. Um, and she's officially a missing person. Um, within a couple of days, I think maybe February 6th, the police held a press conference and explained what was going on to the public um, and uh, basically asked for everybody's help. And in, in, if anyone had any info, you know, where did she go? Uh, where is she? How's she doing? Is she okay? Um, and I guess I don't, I didn't see anything about any, get any crazy leads or anything like that. Um, it doesn't seem to have really kind of captured the public's interest at first. And I saw there's this guy named Josh Dean, who's wrote, written uh, several uh, articles on, on the Elisa Lamb disappearance. And um, I believe one of the one of the ones that he wrote kind of pinpoints why there wasn't a huge public interest in the first like week or even two of her case. Um, it was because Christopher Dorner had gone on his rampage against the LAPD, basically declared war on the LAPD and was killed in, I think, the mountains of San Bernardino in a standoff. 
like right when Elisa Lam went missing. So not only were was the public's attention on this, especially in LA, the LAPD's attention was definitely on that as well. Um, so Elisa Lam was kind of like this faint little chirp in this huge maelstrom at the time. Faint chirp in a maelstrom. It's the best I could come up with on short. It's amazing. Are you kidding me? Oh, thanks. You just made that up? Yeah. Yeah, I did. You like it? Yeah, but I just have a feeling that next time I'm at your house, it's going to be like, that's going to be carved into your desk or something. (laughs) Right. (laughs) It's on a t-shirt. and Right. (laughs) That you put, you make Momo wear that t-shirt every day. (laughs) That's right. Uh, Yeah. And, you know, the other big reason was until this footage actually came out of the elevator, uh, car, then, you know, that's when, um, that's when the public's attention really yeah. caught hold. That because, changed everything. Yeah. I mean, there's no way around it. It's, it's a very sort of unsettling. And I remember when this happened, uh, before any of the facts of the case were kind of out, mm-hmm. I remember looking at this video and it, it is very unsettling and it does appear to be very creepy and that, uh, a young woman gets on an elevator, um, very kind of casually presses all the center buttons on all the floors. Mm -hmm. I think they determined she was on the 14th floor and sort of pressed all the floors uh, on the way down. Uh, Elevator doesn't do anything. The doors don't shut. She moves to the back corner and sort of standing there. She goes and she's, she looks outside of the elevator both ways a couple of times in the hallway and then kind of retreats back quickly. Um, At one point she steps out into the hallway and appears to be gesturing towards Somebody, or she's at least making hand gestures uh, to the right down the hallway. Yeah, and they're unusual hand gestures. They're not like the normal hand gestures you might right. make. They're not at all subtle or casual or almost sure. even like, um, like you know, the, you, you might not even realize you're using your hands when you're talking sometimes. Like these are, yeah, these are more like gesticulations that. than just mm-hmm. mere gestures. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, you know, there's there's no doubt. And eventually she kind of leaves around to the left and exits to the left and the door stays open for a while before it shuts. Mm -hmm. Um, But there's no getting around the fact that having known nothing and knowing that this person disappeared, uh, this young woman, and then you see this, it seems very suspicious Mm -hmm. Um, and creepy. I don't think admittedly creepy. I think it looks I don't even think it looks that creepy. It looks to me like that she is trying to get away from someone and is afraid someone has followed her or is gesturing at a person who she feels threatened by. It's what it it looks like to me. I know other people online are talk about otherworldly spirits Mm -hmm. and she's con, like you said earlier, she's conjuring uh, spirits with her hands. Like I I just, that never occurred to me. It just looked like she might be in some kind of peril and was trying to get away from someone. Right. Um, But that's creepy in and of itself, you know? Yeah, I just mean not creepy and like a supernatural, like what's going on here. No, I think the thing that really, when it really turns creepy to me is when she turns around and hides in the corner Mm -hmm. of the elevator. Like she's, she's hiding. And then the second part that's, that's genuinely creepy is when she like leans out and like looks both ways and then kind of jumps back into the elevator. It's it's just, I mean, it's really hard not to kind of put yourself in her shoes and she's clearly frightened. At that yeah. time. And to see somebody frightened like that, uh, it's uh, that's creepy. And you're and you're waiting on someone to enter the elevator, but that never happens. No. Um and with the internet sleuthing, you, you couldn't really make out the time code very well. And so all the people online are like, Well, why can't you make out the time code and the timestamps? Like, what would degrade that and not the rest of it? And Spirits. and then they they think they right. And then they think they decoded it and there's almost a full minute missing and the hotel Cecil edited out a portion clearly. And before they sent it to the cops and, Mm -hmm. and they interviewed the woman and that you were talking about the manager. And she was like, no, of course we didn't edit anything out. Like we were horrified by this disappearance and just sent him everything we had. Right. Plus I'm sure also that most of the employees that stay on Maine know exactly how to edit video out before handing things over to the cops anyway. Well, it is LA. (laughs) That's true. That is a good point actually. (laughs) But I don't buy it. I think it was it is what it was, which was uh, a person in an elevator who had some uh, was having some mental issues. And, you know, we'll get to that in a second. Um, And I I think, you know, it's sort of like uh, the easiest explanation of the video, at least to me, seems to be the, the most accurate. All right. 
Uh, that that's what I buy. That's how I buy it too. Um, that was so that video was released on February thirteenth, and now all of a sudden, the public is taking notice. Um, she becomes an internet meme like almost overnight, um, with people like watching and analyzing that video, like you were saying, and yet they still can't find her. No one has any idea where she is. It's been two weeks now since she went missing. This video is out there that whole the entire internet is on the case now. And um, it wasn't until a couple days, I think two days after uh, the video came out, Chuck, that um, one of the guys, one of the uh, custodians of the Cecil Hotel, of Stay on Main, I should say, um, was asked to go check on the water supply on the roof uh, because the Cecil Hotel used uh, gravity-fed water. They had four 1,000-gallon tanks on the top of the roof. Uh, and when you open the tap, the water would come pouring down from those tanks into your room and out the faucet. And some of the tenants, uh, I, I, I don't know if it was just the hotel or some long-term tenants, but they were complaining that the water pressure had suddenly gotten really low and that um, the the water that was coming out had a strange odor and taste and a uh, weird kind of uh, color to it. And so they dispatched the uh, custodian to the roof um, and he went and checked, and I think as he was approaching the the main water tank, I think tank number one, he noticed that the hatch was open, and uh, in very short order made a, the the grisly discovery of Elisa Lamb's body. Yeah, he was a he was kind of like the super. He was a maintenance guy. His name is Santiago Lopez, mm-hmm. and he's in the documentary too. Um, I don't think he saw the hatch because the hatch is on top of the tank. But he went to go, and he said it was a routine thing if there was any kind of water issue, Mm -hmm. was to climb the ladder to the tanks and go look and see what was going on because there's probably a clog or something. And uh, he saw her body um, naked about a foot below the water, just sort of suspended there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when they interview this guy in the documentary, it's really sad. You know, he was sort of at the center of a lot of this. Uh, with interviews, and he uh, he was speaking through a, um, I guess not through a translator, but through uh, subtitles. But he was clearly, you know, still very upset about this, and it, it it scarred him to see this woman floating in the tank. And he knew immediately who it was, and called down to the the hotel manager who we've been talking about, and said, you know, she's she's up here in the tank. And uh, you know, the cops came. They they found her clothes, which were determined to be the same clothes. She was wearing in the elevator video, Mm -hmm. um, kind of at the bottom of the tank, they had sunk. Mm -hmm. And, you know, immediately the new mystery is not what's going on in this video, although, you know, that played a part because they were still trying to figure that out as far as foul play goes, but was how she made it in here and and why she made it in there. Yeah, because she, 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 it was like the hatch is not easy to get in or out of, they had to like cut her out of the, they had to cut a hole in the bottom of the tank so they could access it, right? They couldn't just pull her back out of that hatch. So that's kind of weird in and of itself. She's also nude. Um, That also kind of added to the mystery of the whole thing. Um, And then also the, um, you know, the coroner, uh, when when he made his, uh, his toxicology report available, he basically said it was, he wasn't able to make any conclusive um, find any conclusive results because there wasn't enough blood to take a sample from. You know, she had just kind of permeated the water and that or her blood had. Uh, mm-hmm. And there, it wasn't, you just couldn't like take a water sample and be like, oh yeah, there's no, you know, there's no drugs in here or anything like that. So all of that combined really kind of um, just, just took that mystery, um, is, you know, that people had been primed to start thinking about with that video and then just blew it through the, the roof. You know, I mean, the, the, the water being, you know, going to other people's taps in the hotel and, you know, Lisa Lamb basically being a part of that water really kind of solidified her legendary status or the legendary status of her mystery, I think, in people's imagination. Anybody who comes across that case can't help but, like, let the mind wander in that respect. Oh, for sure. I mean, the idea of drinking water and bathing in water with a decomposing body. I mean, the body had was in a pretty, pretty rough state of decomposition at Mm -hmm. that point. Uh, They did do obviously in the autopsy, they didn't find any signs of foul play. There were no uh, obviously no uh, like obvious wounds. There were no internal 
uh, wounds. There was no strangulation. Um, they, they pretty much said this doesn't look like foul play at all. Um, the one, one of the mysteries was how she got up there Yeah, because the, you, um, if you want to go just through the regular staircase to the rooftop and this is not a rooftop that you, you know, doesn't have like a rooftop hangout area or whatever, no. although Mm-mm. people, you know, there was plenty of graffiti and beer bottles and drug needles. And so people would make their way up there. But, uh, if you go through the regular door, it's one of the, um, alarm doors, which would trigger downstairs and all throughout the lobby. Um, that never came on and you have to have a key to disable it, but there is a fire escape, uh, entry with a ladder basically for the last, like the, for the last story, it's a little precarious, Yeah, but she, she could have just simply gone out the window to the fire escape and climbed up the ladder and then up the ladder to the tanks. It's not, you know, it, it's a little, um, it would be a little bit of a scary trip up that ladder, I right. think. Yeah. But uh, considering what happened, she she clearly was uh, was not in a good place mentally. So yeah. I think that's completely believable. That journalist Josh Dean um, went in I think 2015 to see the Cecil himself. He had uh, gotten obsessed with the the um, case, so he went and, and kind of investigated it in person, and um, he quickly found that open window was still open uh, and the, the fire escape was easily accessible. And um, in the, uh, I think one of his articles is called American Horror Story, which is a reference to um, what I think the hotel season of American Horror Story was based mm-hmm. on or inspired by Elisa Lamb's disappearance. Um, but there's a picture that he took of that ladder leading from the fire escape on the fifth, 15th or 14th floor up to the roof Mm-hmm. And all you see is up, like you just see the ladder and then above it is sky. But mm-hmm. after reading about it, y- your imagination just thinks of like the 15 stories behind you. Like as you're, you know, as you're looking up this ladder, it's one of the most unsettling pictures I've ever seen. If you read the text, uh, uh, you know, that surround it. Um, but he said by his judgment, uh, an average person could easily make it up that ladder, especially if you don't look down. Yeah. He said, if you're carrying a body or another person, you could not do it. He said it just would be too no. difficult. And, uh, you know, yeah, it's, it's one of those straight up vertical ladders on the side of the building. Yeah. But if you were in a manic state, as a lot of people believe uh, Elisa Lam was, um, you could probably make it up that ladder pretty quickly. and You wouldn't even necessarily consider looking down and all of a sudden you'd be on the roof. And after you were on the roof, it would be a fairly easy proposition to get into one of those tanks, especially I think she weighed about 115 pounds and was about mm-hmm. five feet, four inches. So it was possible for her to get into one of those tanks through that hatch but um, it, either she was too scared to come out conceivably <clears throat> or she couldn't get out when she wanted to get out and tired of treading water because the water would have been about eight feet deep and drowned after a while. Yeah, I mean, the, they did. Uh, I think the police dogs did pick up her scent near that window. Mm-hmm. So that seems to be what happened. And, uh, you know, this is one of those cases where the more I read, like all I could feel was, despair about this poor woman Mm -hmm. having uh, what looked to be some sort of medication related manic episode, maybe scared, maybe thinking someone was following her and trying to get away and, and going at great lengths, going to great lengths to maybe hide somewhere Mm -hmm. like inside of a water tank. Um, I I don't know like why her clothes were off or why her clothes ended up in the tank. I'm not saying any of this makes sense, but it is something that could happen. And all I can think about is what an awful place that she must have been for something like this to have happened. Yeah. And I mean, to kind of back up the um, the the mental break um, theory, which is what I buy. That's, that's, I, that's where I put my stock. Um, she remember I said she was originally put in a room with uh, a couple other girls she didn't know at the stay on Maine, they complained about her behaving strangely. So she was moved to her own private room. Um, Apparently she went to a taping of the Conan O'Brien show and uh, was escorted out because she was behaving strangely. And then um, detectives also found she was on four different medications for uh, bipolar one disorder and depression. And um, the LAPD uh, based on the, the, um, 
the prescription dates on the bottles and then the number of pills that were left and the instructions on the bottles, um, the LAPD were able to determine that she hadn't been following um, the the dosage recommendations or taking yeah. her pills or medication. So if you put all of that together and then also that um, it, people taking their clothes off as part of a psychotic episode happens, it's been documented, um, yeah. you like there's no there's no pieces missing on the table like she could have gone out on that fire escape gone up the ladder like there's nothing that is well yeah but then there's this really big thing that remains unexplained like it explains absolutely everything and then suddenly yeah. it kind of makes all the other stuff like government mind control or ghosts or whatever seem just kind of gross you know totally agree uh i believe her parents brought a lawsuit against the hotel that was eventually dismissed if I'm not mistaken. And um, it just remains a very, very sad situation and a sad case. And, and it is very annoying when you get online and everyone thinks that their spirits being conjured and, and, and all this wacky stuff is just not the case. Not the case. Indeed. You got anything else? I got nothing else. Well, that's it for the Cecil hotel and the Lisa lamb RIP. Uh, and since I said RIP, that means it's time for a listener mail. Uh, I'm going to call this follow-up to Y2K. Oh, yes. Uh, and this is something that we actually had in our notes that we, I guess, just kind of failed to bring up. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, you had it in your notes as well? Yeah. Yeah. The, the 2038 problem. Um, and we got a lot of emails about this, and, and we're not going to fully probably explain to everyone's satisfaction how it works, but... Um, Hey guys, just got done listening to the Y2K podcast, which brought back an interesting range of memories of living through that time. In case you weren't aware, there's something called the Unix Y2K problem that still exists, but is slowly being fixed by smart people behind the scenes. Thank goodness. Uh, The majority of computers in the world run run Unix-based operating systems, uh, not Windows or Mac OS. And unless these systems are patched at 3.14 on January 19th, 2038, Uh, Their clocks will roll over to think it's midnight, January 1st, 1970. Yes. Uh, The cause is basically the same in the early versions of the OS. Only had so much memory allocated to time representations, but more modern versions now have this fixed, and hence computers aren't susceptible once they're updated or upgraded, although not all systems can be easily updated. Uh, And that is from a bunch of people, but specifically from uh, PhD Alan Chalker. That's great. Thanks, Alan, to everybody who wrote in. I was like, oh, man, I meant to include that. But yeah. it, apparently Unix um, represents time as the number of seconds from the epoch date, which is uh, some date in 1970. And then eventually it's going to have more seconds than it can represent in the number of digits. So it'll just roll back over like he was saying, which is pretty Come neat. On, Unix? Pretty cool. <clears throat> but and also I'm glad to hear that there are smart people working on that because we got... 17 years man you guys take it easy take a weekend you know sure go uh go sit in your house and social distance from everybody that's right we all, we also got a lot of emails just from people that uh some people whose parents helped rewrite code or were heading up projects rewriting code and it was it was pretty cool we got a lot of a lot of emails about that one yeah. struck a chord yeah it was a good idea chuck um, well, if you want to get in touch with us like Alan and everybody else did, you can send us an email. Send it off to stuffpodcast at iHeartRadio.com. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.